If you enjoyed this episode, please consider making a donation to the podcast via Venmo to the username at NQCATX. Hello and welcome to Next Quest Podcast, where I ask your potential therapist questions so you don't have to. I am your host, Noah S. Garcia, Licensed Professional Counselor Supervisor. Amanda's still out on tour this week, unfortunately driving during our recording time again. But you know, each week Amanda and I come up with questions for each guest, so I'll be asking hers in her absence today. Onward to the show. Today I welcome Cynthia Schiebel, Licensed Professional Counselor Supervisor and Licensed Chemical Dependency Counselor, who will be speaking about her practice in an area of specialty, Boundaries as a Spiritual Practice. Welcome to the show, Cynthia. Hey, thanks, Noah. Glad to be here. Super excited about this uh, topic today um, and, and really excited to have you on talking about this. So to get started, what are your credentials and experience? I am a licensed professional counselor supervisor and LPCS. I'm also a licensed chemical dependency counselor and I'm an advanced certified prevention specialist that came in handy when I worked with the education settings and worked with a lot of prevention programs. And then outside of my therapeutic world, I'm a board certified coach. Which, which is it that International Board of, is it IBC um, or what is the name of so it? You're thinking um, International Coaching Federation. They're maybe, kind of, maybe that's what I'm thinking. They're an over umbrella, uh, which has their own guideline, um, kind of credentialing uh, uh, requirements. But I credentialed through um, another uh, agency uh, and they actually just started a few years ago. So a lot of us got to grandfather in who already had their coaching foundations coursework behind them and a certain number of coaching uh, experience. So um, I'm a board certified coach instead of a, uh, I forget what their credentials are called uh, through ICF, master certified coach, I think, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what I'm thinking of. Okay, very cool. Um, so is the name of your practice your name or, or do you have a, a different name for your practice? It's just my name. I am my own brand. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So do you accept insurance? If so, which ones? If not, why not? And also, do you have any sliding scale or reduced fee options available to clients? I do not accept insurance. And um Primarily, the reason was because I didn't start accepting insurance when I went uh, full time into my private practice when I moved here to Austin. And so I just never did um, get credentialed in uh, the different insurance companies. Um, as far as sliding scales um, or reduced fee options, uh, I have nothing advertised as sliding scales. Uh, what I encourage clients when we discuss um, during uh, you know, the consent and our agreement around uh, working with me. Uh, when we discuss fees, I let clients know, uh, I want you to use your voice. And if the fee becomes a problem, ask me for something different. And that starts us right off 
uh, with the empowerment of you're in charge of your therapy. And if the fee is an issue that keeps you from coming to therapy, I want you to uh, bring that up uh, in session and bring it up with me and let's discuss it. So I will say, yes, I've been known to have uh, clients who I consider on, who have fun fairs. <laughs> awesome. I, I love that you do that. I, uh, that's, that's kind of how I approach things myself with my clients. Um, so, you know, we're in this continued state of pandemic. Are you currently seeing clients via telehealth, in-person, combo, both? I am seeing clients only by telehealth. And I actually gave up my office space um, a year ago in January. Awesome. That's awesome. I'm, I'm uh, giving mine up at the end of the month. Yeah. I signed... I signed a two-year lease in February 2020. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I get it. <laughs> well, I was fortunate enough to, uh, it sat, you know, empty for quite a while, but um, I was fortunate enough to have someone uh, step up right at the end of my lease to say, oh, I'll take that. So I was glad awesome. to, to let go. Yes. And it was good for them and good for me. Yeah. I love, love when things work out that way. So Cynthia, is being a therapist your first career, if not what was, and also what was it that ultimately drew you to being a therapist? So I, I was thinking about what was my very first job. My very first job was when I was probably elementary age and I made potholders on these little metal looms with these cotton loops and I would go up and down the street and sell them for a nickel. And uh, I love it. <laughs> so I started out in sales, but education was really what I was always interested in. And so my first career was as an educator. I was um, I was trained as a speech pathologist. Uh, oh wow! But I also I first taught English uh, at middle school level for um, uh, resource students, and because there wasn't a speech therapy job open. And then the following year, I went into uh, being a speech pathologist for a public school district. And then I went back and picked up my counseling certification. And uh, because uh, speech therapy is also a small group activity uh, at sure, schools, yeah. and many, many students, when it's one-on-one -on -one or in small group, are sharing things beyond just their difficulty in expressing themselves. And that's when I found that, wow, speech therapy is sometimes like a little counseling session. Why aren't I just doing counseling with kids. <laughs> so it was a very natural transition. And um, I was a school counselor for many years. And then I went into um, a regional education service center as a, a coordinator for Title IV Safe and Drug-Free Schools. And um, I kind of transitioned to thinking, wow, if we could help teachers to learn how to deal with these special populations of kids, especially kids who come from families that uh, might have uh, some form of dysfunction or imbalance or skewed uh, relational experiences such as addictions, then uh, I'll be impacting, you know, a classroom of kids all at once if I can help those teachers get trained in those things. So I worked in prevention, did a lot of uh, teacher training, and uh, that's what brought me to the Austin area. Um, I worked with Round Rock for a while and then Eanes ISD. And then in 2005, um, I had my full-time counseling practice and went full-time uh, in private practice. Awesome. That's a really cool journey. Thank you for sharing that with us. It was uh, just a step to step to step. You look back yeah. and you go, wow, how did that all happen? But Yeah, you know, it's funny because I, I know for a lot of people, what stops them from starting things a lot of the time is not knowing the process. And, but to me, like, you don't have to know the path to get started. Like that's how you discover the path is by moving through it. You know, that's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Somebody said, yeah, pick up the oar and start rowing and the boat will appear. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's you don't a have really, to see it. It. You, yeah. It's okay to question it, but just do the work and something will start making sense. Yeah. 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 So in your practice with your clients, what modalities do you draw upon and what sorts of evidence do you use to rely on to support your treatment of choice? And in general, how do you stay up to date about new information in the field? Okay. 
Uh, I don't know if you remember, but you know, when we had our masters, uh, probably our orals for our LPC or uh, for our masters or something, you know, that was always the question. So what is your therapy modality? What, you know, what are you going to be doing? And all of us in our, you know, cohort were going eclectic, right? Eclectic. Is that the word? Is it eclectic? And it was like, of course it's eclectic, which I think most of us experience anyway, but you know, I do a lot of, uh, of CBT cognitive behavior and also a lot of reality, um, you know, in this sense of, you know, just really counting in on what's happening. What are you doing? How is that working for you? What would you rather be experiencing? I wonder what we can do to explore moving toward that. Um, and I do a lot around attachment. I've learned so much more about attachment styles. Um, and how that dovetails with uh, the work that I've been mainly trained in, which is, I'm guessing we could call it a modality, but um, I've trained for years with Pia Melody and the model that they use at the Meadows Treatment Facility in Arizona um, is the model that I refer most often to in working with my clients. And as far as keeping you know abreast, I continue to uh, you know, get my CEUs in areas that are of interest to me. And uh, that's actually one of the great advantages I've found throughout the pandemic is I've probably attended more webinars and, um, you know, workshops online and heard more people than I would have ever done uh, before. And because you can do it at any time you want to listen to it. Yeah. And it's been really fascinating. So I've been kind of honing some of that uh, information from the people who are out there doing a lot of brain science uh, work. And that that fascinates me, um, learning about how the brain works and how it dovetails into what we're doing every day with, with clients. I agree. It's fascinating and it makes a lot of sense, you know? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Once we kind of know it, and, and I find that clients really find it interesting too, that there's a reason, there's a why that it's a struggle. Right. And that it's, it's more often than not, you know, at a cellular level and that we have the capacity to, to override that by firing some new neural transmission pathways. Oh you know, yeah. That's what I'm all about is creating those new neural pathways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what we, that, that, was, that is beneficial for all of us to continue. Doing that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, Cynthia, tell us more about yourself. Like, what are your hobbies, interests, TV shows you're watching, music you listen to, pets, etc.? Well, uh, you've already experienced, our listeners haven't heard yet, and we probably won't because she's sound asleep. Um, I do have a pet, my <laughs> pet, Bijou, who often uh, roams through uh, the, the house and lets me know that she wants more attention than what I'm giving to other people. <laughs> Many times clients will say, oh my gosh, do you have a baby? And I'll say, yes, <laughs> it's a cat that's acting like a baby, even though she's right. 16 years old. Yeah. But um, as far as my hobbies, um, I also, I'm, a, uh, I'm an usher now, a volunteer usher over at Texas Performing Arts and at Zach uh, Scott Theater. So I uh, love musicals. I love uh comedy, plays, and theater. So I'm, I love uh, going and seeing shows. Um, I'm also um, interested myself. It's not my vocation, but my advocation is acting and theater and some film. And so I have a lot of that under my belt and have missed that during the pandemic, that there haven't been a lot of opportunities to go and audition and uh, get on the stage and do some things. So um, also, um, I've, uh, as far as getting my hands busy, I've done a lot of basket weaving and um, I've had a great teacher to, to help me learn that. And I used to take a lot of classes over at Hill Country Weavers and um, that's been gone a while. Underwater basket weaving? Underwater, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And getting that snorkel just right. So, yeah. No, not quite underwater <laughs> basket weaving, but Oh, that's sad that we've referred to that so often now that I have such an appreciation of the, of the real <laughs> skill, skill of basket weaving. So, oh, um, no, it, it is. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not I'm not knocking it as a, a skill. Very med I, I, meditative for me. It's you get into a little rhythm of getting your hands going in a pattern. And then it's just it's nearly like you're in a zone of um, you talked about fishing, doing that for you. Yeah. 
sometimes. Yeah, no, I, I have lots of clients who crochet and knit, and it is, you know, I, I super respect it because it's something that I have tried several times in the past, and I just cannot, cannot get the hang of it. Um, so I have a, a very big appreciation for all those sorts of things, and what a neat skill. Yep. It's, it, it is neat. You know, once you have all the materials, that's what I loved about the classes is the materials were, you know, you paid for the class, you got the materials, you started and ended with a basket. You walked out with a basket sometimes to finish up at that's home. Cool. It was really, yeah, really nice. So, so that's a, that's a little bit about me. I have a great um, pal, a friendship group here in Austin. And so we do things, you know, socially together and, I'm learning some new uh, card games uh, that I had not put my brain to that is a little harder than crazy eights. And so that's, <laughs> uh, that's been fun to do as well. So That's very cool. Very, very interesting stuff you're up to there. And I walk a lot. I have a, a, a fun neighborhood to go mm -hmm. walking in. And so in between clients, often I throw on my shoes and get out there and go, just if I just go to the end of the block and back, it's, it's helpful. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I don't know about you, but sitting more times than not, my, my back has definitely taken a toll. Yeah. We're starting to notice it. Our, yeah, for sure. We're yeah. going to have our own little physical issues. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> Therapist syndromes that are elbow, you know, tennis elbow, it's going to be <laughs> yeah. it's an occupational hazard is what it is. Exactly. <laughs> Right. Well, Cynthia, to give us a more more of an idea about the people that you work with, describe your ideal client. Hmm. You know, I I think um, an ideal client for me initially is someone who's motivated to shift who is curious enough to say what I'm doing is not working. I don't know what I need, but I'm willing to hear you out, you know, to sit here and figure out, you know, to have help to explore that. That's ideal. Um, and I don't know that I've had any clients who haven't shown up for that reason. You know, there may be some other motives. I get that. Save a marriage, uh, you know, get somebody off their back. Uh, please the court or, or you know, a yeah. hundred different reasons that kind of is the alligator on our ass that's chasing us into <laughs> the therapy room, you know, but um, ultimately I think people, they don't show up because they don't know. They know there's something else, but they just don't know what it is. Um, in addition to that, I think, um, you know, I really, I work with a large uh, population that's uh, involved in um, recovery systems of some sort or have done their mm -hmm. own work or um, are on that path. And uh, there's a, a reference in 12-step uh, literature uh, in regards to at some point in time, we realize that it's more than just staying sober, that we are, there's a great line that says we're rocketed into the fourth dimension. And fourth dimension clients are probably um they're kind of the most exciting for me to because they figured out i get the family of origin piece i really they've worked hard and and then they're figuring out there's more to this and then we're kind of in that spiritual realm of of settling into life as life is and right. um and that i think draws into the room um spiritual development and uh, more of a, a spiritual counseling setting, which really feeds my soul. Which, which brings me to the next question, which was Amanda's question, uh, which is, in what ways would you relate boundaries to a spiritual practice? Yeah, that's a great question, isn't it? It's like, wait, what's the connection? So, and this I learned actually from uh, Pia Melody, kind of describing uh, boundaries this way from her perspective is that, you know, when we are actively, um, when we have some healthy boundaries on board and, and they're activated, uh, two spiritual principles are being um, 
uh, stirred up, uh, truth and love. And so if we think about, um, you know, boundaries are about respecting other people and esteeming ourselves. Uh, boundaries create curiosity versus defensiveness. And when I'm practicing having some sense of boundary, this I, call, I think of it as kind of this energetic force, I can hold you over there and hear more about your truth. I get to learn about you out of curiosity. And while I'm containing me, I'm being loving. And vice versa, when I'm containing me, I get to be insightful into my own reality, what I make myself think or feel. And while I'm doing that, I'm being more loving to you and the world because I'm not throwing up on you. I'm not being offending. And so if we think of it as when I'm actively engaged in my boundary system, I'm being respectful, which is the lowest form of loving someone. I'm being respectful. And I'm also in a state of knowing more about what a bigger truth is. And, um, and I'm just being loving to myself and other people. Right. And, you know, when we don't set those boundaries, you know, the, the reason why it's a loving thing to do is because when we don't set them, a lot of times for people that can breed like feelings of resentment, which then in turn impacts the way we treat that person, you know, and, and it becomes a, a significant issue within the relationship. That's right. Yes. That, yeah. Resentment always creates a, a fracture. And, you know, when we, uh, well, that's a whole nother topic about resentments, but, you know, <laughs> I, I teach a lot that, you know, resentments, uh, the precursor, the prerequisite of any resentment is an expectation that goes unmet or unspoken. Right. And, and probably that's because I haven't used my voice because I didn't learn how to do it. And so I actually am walled off and I don't speak something because I'm telling myself a story um, and it's usually an abandonment story. If I say this, then you will ultimately leave me. You won't pick me or see me or hear me. And then I'll be alone and I'll die. And even though our logical brain says that's not true, but that old wiring will really keep us from using our voice bravely. So empowering ourselves to, to take that risk and to, and to see, wow, I can actually show up for myself and have enough boundary to state whatever I need to state, even an expectation about your, about your behavior. I can do that with respect and compassion. Totally, totally. And I think it also is a reminder to us to manage our expectations too. You know, yeah. I think that has a lot to do with it as well. Like, you know, you're expecting something of somebody that they don't have no clue you were expect, expecting from them, you know, it just, it sets the whole thing up to just blow up, you know? Yes. Um, yes. So there's a lot of like interrelated things here talking about like resentment, communication, um, expectations, you know, lots of big stuff. That's right. And, you know, uh, so when I trained with PO, we learn about these kind of these five core practices that, you know, in her early years, she re referenced to as codependence, but she kind of shifted to describe it more as just relational immaturity. We didn't learn how to be relational with ourselves and other people. And so it kind of skewed these five core areas that all humans experience. And one of them is certainly boundaries, but it's our self-esteem and our, our reality, owning our own reality, that how we think and feel. Uh, being, you know, engaged in our self-care and then trying to be moderate in all things. And that whole piece about, you know, boundaries and self-esteem and our sense of reality are so interrelated. They're so dovetailed that we can't experience one without the other. But boundaries, in my, in my opinion, boundaries are always kind of the hub of the wheel. If we can get settled and... Uh, get this in place where I'm protecting myself and containing myself, then I can own my reality. I can hear your reality differently. Um, I won't beat myself up. That inner critic won't be so uh, on board. 
because I can be more present to the world as it is. Being in love with reality is our big job. And and also, you know, going back to self-esteem, you know, after you allow yourself to be locked on for so long, like that in and of itself impacts self-esteem, you know, Um, and then people are kind of in the boat of why does this always happen to me? Yes. And then that's where you're realizing, oh, it looks like with this person in these situations, I had too little boundary. I didn't have enough protection. I didn't pick me enough. Right. Yeah. Right. And so there's right. a consequence. And then it's like, well, do you want to do something different? Yes. Well, that's an action. We can we can learn to do that. Yeah. yeah. And, and so we've kind of touched on this in in the question I just asked, but maybe to more explicitly state this, why are boundaries and relationships important? And what happens in relationships when we don't set these? Yeah, so I think the primary, you know, what most of us would recognize is to have healthy boundaries in a relationship creates a foundation of safety and security and helps us to be able to use our voice without fear of retaliation, uh, to, you know, express our needs, to navigate repair when there are fractures, because there will be, and to just experience, you know, um, compassion to to allow this person to be who they are, which is the most, you know, loving thing and respectful thing we can do is can I let you be you and not need you, right, for me to be okay. Yeah, which is a form of negative, a negative control, which is a boundary violation. Right. Yeah. And so when boundaries are present, we can navigate through all that. It may be sloggy and messy at times. Fine. That's what humans are sloggy and messy at times. That's how we learn. That's how we learn. But if we just keep at it, we'll get, you know, we'll find that we're, we're developing some a skill set that it becomes a little more, um, it feels safer to do it over time. And without boundaries, that's what we're going to do. We're either going to stay um, way walled off or we're going to be too much in somebody's face. Um, Peter kind of describes uh, boundaries, too little boundaries when we're too porous. Uh, I think everybody can understand this. We're a bit of a shit ass. And uh-huh. but the other end of the continuum, the other end of the seesaw, when we're walled off, we're a tight ass. Love that. <laughs> so everybody can kind of recognize I'm either being a tight ass right now or I'm being a shit ass. <laughs> yeah. So we're trying to let go of that because if we're in those extremes with our boundaries, that's just a reflection of our damaged boundaries, which right. we which happened when we were way, way, way little. This is where it dovetails so beautifully to attachment theory is, you know, what birth to three. I mean, we were figuring things out in yeah. some way or another. We were sensing things then. And then we were telling ourselves a message around three, three and a half, four, that all of this that's going on around me is centered around me. And I need right. to adapt. I need to change to keep some big face attached to me so I can survive. And right. that adapting, that shifting is what's changing the story. And in some of the stories, it's I need to be walled off to protect myself, to keep you near me. And other times I need to have no boundaries and be over in your business and taking care of you, primary caregiver, you know, which is not my job, but I don't know that. But that sets us up for later to experience that and we normalize it. And so then it becomes an issue in in our big relationships, which, you know, I do see couples and, um, and that's what I think, you know, the conflict of our boundary systems is, uh, is often what I, you know, what I can help couples to understand, oh, yeah, that's why we're here, because we don't know another way to do it. Right. We're doing it the way that was normalized, but we're we're changing and maturing, but that skill set's not maturing. Right. So so what can we do to learn it a different way? So I'm trained, I'm a level two person in PAC, you know, Stan Tatkin's PAC um, couples uh, training and you know, there's a lot of work around that of, of when we're dysregulated and recognizing that in our partner and 
dysregulation, boundaries. There are no boundaries when we're dysregulated. Mm -hmm. Boundaries are from frontal cortex. So we have to get back into regulation to actually experience having boundaries. That makes sense. Yeah. And so, so yes, it's going to obviously affect not just relationships with significant others, but our friendships and relationships, right. parent, child, and people we work with. And, you know, the people we're driving beside on Mopac. I mean, if we're flipping somebody off, <laughs> we're, we're a bit of a shit ass. So <laughs> check that boundary system. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The the way that I I've kind of conceptualized that is, you know, when we're younger, we we create these adaptive strategies as a result of trauma, and at some point in our lives, they're no longer effective, and in fact, start to hurt us. Um, and and then you know that gives us a lot of information about like what's going on and tracking it back to what this is a result of. You know, I think is also really important. Absolutely. And that's, that's the great gift of trauma work is to, you know, or, or if we just, you know, my take is once we start adapting to our primary caregivers system, the adapting in ourself is our trauma. Right. Yes. We certainly might be experiencing people who have very poor boundaries and are offending physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, sexually. But what I'm telling me, myself about me, that shifting of me, that is my trauma. Yes. And, I, and I think it's, it's core for us to do some kind of work around that, whatever modality works for people yeah. to get connected, to kind of see the bigger truth about our inherent value and worth, which has always been there. And will always be there. Yeah, I love, love how you just explained that. Um, so uh, the next question is one of my questions. Okay. Um, in my decade of experience as a therapist, the one thing that I find that most people commonly lack knowledge or mastery of is assertiveness and the ability to set and maintain healthy boundaries, including saying no, whether or not they've experienced some sort of trauma, but also especially if they have experienced trauma. Um, it seems like such an invaluable life skill that is unfortunately not taught in our schools, but in my opinion is so necessary to be. So when you talk with your clients about boundaries, how do you go about introducing your clients? All of that that you just said is yes, 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 yes. That's exactly right. You know, I would, yes, we've, that is true. We don't have a system that teaches us this stuff very well at all. And quite frankly, uh, probably for a reason, huh? For a reason, <laughs> because yes, I can't teach what I don't know. <laughs> well, well, not just that, but, but you know, if I, I think that 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 prevents people from using their voices, and and when people don't use their voices, other people tend to take control and power. You know. Uh, yes. Right. Right. So how I introduce is usually, I mean right off the bat, regardless of what somebody shows up in the door saying, here's what's going on. It's very easy to say that must be a struggle, you know, to start already recognizing, oh, I either don't have enough boundary in this situation, or I have too much boundary. I'm walled off. And um, I give all of my clients, um, a kind of an introductory set of handouts that is a simple explanation of these five core practices that get skewed uh, for most people in their childhood. And boundaries is one of them. And then I have a, a single page that's just about boundaries, defines boundaries, the two different systems of boundaries, our external, physical, sexual boundaries, and our internal boundaries which is about our thinking, feeling, behavior, you know, wants and needs. And uh, and we just start uh, using those as examples so that when things come up in the session, we can go right back to, so let's, you know, think about that. Do you think that's too little boundary or too much? And they'll pretty soon, pretty, I don't have enough boundary with them. Yeah, that's right. So I wonder what that would look like. 
well, I'd need to say something to them. And then I have, I mean, I'm an educator. I've got handouts. <laughs> so I've got a, a one page on the talking and listening boundary. It's a, it's a actual skill that I teach clients. Let's go. There's a script. We're going to practice it. So how would you approach this next time? Start with the data. Start with, then say how you make yourself think about something. What's your perception? How do you feel about that? Do you have a request for them? See if you can state that without it being a demand, a gentle request. Yeah. When you're listening to somebody, oh, they make me, my buttons get pushed. There's a red flag. If your buttons are pushed, what does that tell you? Oh, I don't have enough protecting boundary. That's right. So think about getting that in place. And while you're doing that, let's think about why are you listening to this person? Is it to form a defense or is it to learn about them? Oh, that's harder to think of it as learning about them. Yes, it is. Because our midbrain wants to form the defense. We're going straight to, yeah, but. And so that's the practice is, ah, can you breathe into that and get yourself out of the, and to really listen to learn. So, you know, it, it doesn't take long. I mean, the first session we're already talking about, we're bringing it in, we're kind of weaving it in because whatever the initial, here's why I think I'm here, there's probably a great example of boundary failure embedded in that. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, which the next question is one of Amanda's questions, and I also have a, a comment. Uh, she asks, what is the difference between setting boundaries and having protective walls? And then my additional question is, you know, if I'm not a shit ass and if I'm not a tight ass, does that just make me an ass? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but a pleasant one to be around. <laughs> a loving, respectful. Yeah, yeah Exactly. Um, yeah, that's a great question about, you know, boundaries and protective walls. And I think that's what I find with most um, clients and, and, and actually with some, you know, other professional colleagues, you know, when we talk about boundaries, I think how I've, how I um, perceive boundaries as this fluid dynamic. Um, I think of it as kind of this force field, you know, and that's, you know, expressing in two directions simultaneously. I'm holding out the world so I can observe it. And I'm also containing myself so I can observe me. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm doing, when I'm protecting myself, that's me choosing to love me, but it's protecting me from incoming so that I can learn about the world. And then when I'm containing myself, I'm actually, it's an expression of loving you because I'm not throwing up on you, you know? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. when I set boundaries and boundaries, only you can set your own boundaries. We, we don't set boundaries for other people. We don't tell other people what their boundaries need to be. We only express and communicate. This is what's negotiable or non-negotiable. And this is, hey, when this happened, I'm noticing I'm kind of wigging myself out. Can we discuss this? That's, we're just sharing to be known. So I have a right to set my own boundaries, physically, sexually, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And I have, you know, examples about spirit, about boundary violations. So I determine my boundaries. But we do over time find that there are relationships that we choose to continue to be in for whatever reason, that we might need to choose a protective wall, a wall of protection. And that can be a wall of silence. It can be a wall of pleasant, or it can be a wall of absence. I remove myself from you at a certain point in time. And as long as we're choosing that to take care of ourselves, and we're not just choosing a wall to avoid being relational, that's the difference. It's that makes a lot of sense. That makes sense. It's, it's about I'm choosing to love me. And so I want to be in relationship with you. And I know that you have damaged boundaries. So what am I going to do to protect myself to continue the relationship? And it may be that I limit my time with you. 
but I still reach out or I'll let you know I care about you or whatever. I see you, but I see you with a group of other people <laughs> or um, I don't be around you. I choose a, a wall of absence or in the midst, you know, at social gatherings, we can many times, I think a lot of people use a wall of pleasant. Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. And then, excuse me, I'm, I'm going to go, yeah. And so that's okay. And that's, that beats being um, a shit ass. Okay. Yes. So up on the side of your fan, you're full of crap and I don't want to listen to you. Or are you nuts? And, you know, are getting in a debate about stuff that is not really worth our universal time. So. Right. Okay. Next one is a, another Amanda question. She asks, or, or also states, boundaries of self-care is an essential part of adapting to the world particularly for those who are assigned female birth who are conditioned to people please and ignore boundaries. How do we combat this conditioning? And, and I'll go on to say, I have a lot of men who struggle with this too. But yes, I think culturally um, uh, females do experience this probably more often, but this is, I think it's pretty universal to be a people pleaser. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I kind of describe it as I adjust myself to keep your emotional boat steady. If I start sensing, sensing that you're going to start rocking and rolling, I adapt. I shut down. I'll be quiet. I, I make an amend. I apologize for breathing. I try to fix something. Um, I distract. I change the subject. But that's still, I'm adapting to keep your emotional boat steady. Right. Because this old part in my brain says to me often, if they get upset with you, they're going to leave you and you'll die. So, um, you know, how we go about overcoming that is by practicing having boundaries and having the experience. What is the... Uh, Julian Shore uses, uh, you know, boundary work is memory reconcilia uh, reconciliation, reconciliation. It, am I saying that right? Memory reconciliation. Recon reconsolidation. Consol yeah, reconsolidation. That's right. So when we practice uh, having a boundary, you know, we're disconfirming the original story. Right. You know, we're overriding the first software, you know, by by running new software, and we do that often enough so that it creates a new neural pathway, but it, it, it disconfirms the original story that I don't deserve to have a voice, that I need to shut down right now, or that I'll die if you decide you don't like me, or you disagree, or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, and that just takes practice and practice and more practice. But people-pleasing, I think, is probably people-pleasing and negative control are probably the most common boundary failures that we notice in all of us. Yeah, it makes sense. I, I definitely do see that in, in the work that I do. Yeah, and negative control, I'll, I'll give a little quick definition. Negative control yeah. in sense is, uh, negative control is when I need another person on the planet to think or feel or behave a certain way so I can feel comfortable. I need you to change so I can calm down. So it's that external regulation experience. Right, right, right. Uh, like, yeah. And those are probably the most common, you know, either we're really focused on, I'm here in therapy to change somebody else, or I'm here in therapy because I don't know how to have a voice in the relationships I'm in, you know, to get right. money. Yeah. I don't know how to do it. Yeah. You know, I've I've noticed that people tend to struggle with like there's a, a several common barriers when I think about it when it comes to the idea of setting maintaining boundaries ranging from it feeling impolite or selfish or being overly concerned with how it might make the other person feel. How do you go about helping your clients overcome barriers such as those? 
Yeah, you know, one I think is kind of helping people to get a kind of a visualization, whatever works for them about coming, coming to moderation. So if we experience ourselves either being a tight ass or shit ass, you know, uh, we're trying to come back, we're trying to come into moderation Mm -hmm. so that we are determining what I let in, what I keep out, what I share with you, what I don't share with you. I'm the keeper of that. I regulate those little doors to share or not share, to take in or not take in. And it's normal. I I try to normalize that, that when we've had two little boundaries, we've been kind of all enmeshed in these relationships and we're not getting our needs met. Everybody's miserable. And we start having boundaries. It's the natural, our natural response is I'm being a bitch. They're not going to like me. And they may even say, what's wrong with you? What are you doing? You're being mean to me. And often what that'll do is trigger up back down in that midbrain, Mm -hmm. the people pleasing part. I don't want your vote rocking. So I'll come right back in and get re-engaged in the relationship the same way. And then we're all miserable again. Yeah. And so I I just over and over show this. uh, I know your audience won't see my hands, but I show this kind of standing upright. And we just need to remind ourselves people are going to vibrate when you have boundaries that you haven't had before. Allow them the dignity and right to vibrate. They'll either crash and get up from there or they'll get up from here and start relating differently with you, or they'll go find someone else to stay all engaged with the same old way. But your work is to get here and to remind yourself by affirming, usually, I have a right to determine my needs and wants. I have a right, and I can share my my truth with respect and compassion, and your response to me having a boundary is not my work. And that, that story is probably the one that's the hardest for us to remind ourselves. You, isn't that interesting? You're reacting to me taking care of myself. That's not my work. That's your work. And I said, you know, not that I said, that's what you're running. That's this, you're running that little affirmation in your head. Right. I wouldn't be saying it out loud to that person, but you could acknowledge and say, it looks like you're really having a hard time with me having some new boundaries for myself. This is about Mm -hmm. me taking care of myself. And I acknowledge that it's a struggle for you and I support you to get whatever help you need to take care of yourself. Yeah. Go talk to your own therapist, you know? Yeah, 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 totally. And I think that's where people have the hardest time is, you know, it's, uh, it relates back to like a fear of rejection or abandonment, Um, you know? And sometimes when we set boundaries, Sometimes that does happen, but also like that makes the space in your life for healthy relationships, you know? Exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. And that's a hard reality for people, all of us. I mean, me included, that there are going to be some times that you will have boundaries and people will leave. Right. And then the the kind of the opposite of that, which Mm -hmm. kind of relates to Amanda's question which is essentially like, what do you do when somebody doesn't listen to your boundaries? Um, even though like it's a normal, like it's a normal everyday human thing. It should be anyway. Um, you know, what do you do when, you know, especially thinking from like, I guess thinking from both a micro and a macro level, thinking from like your personal individual life and like society as a whole. Truth and love, truth and love. Whose life are you going to live? You're here on the planet to live one life. And if we keep messing with, I need to keep adapting to make it okay for you, we're going to be on that deathbed with regrets. And we're trying to live fully and not experience that to the best that we can from here forward. And so... You know, I I think that um, somebody asked me that uh, the other day and we were talking about, well, you know, the concept about the butterfly wings, Mm -hmm. you know, impacts the entire, you know, universe. You having boundaries impacts the entire universe. Mm -hmm. 
and just keep doing what your own reality, what is about you showing up for yourself most fully. And, and if we're doing it with respect and compassion, we aren't stomping on people. We're not being mean. We're, we're expressing love to ourselves, And therefore it's, it's, you get, you get a truer version of me. And that's my gift to the world is you get to experience me authentically. And if I'm not who you want me to be, that's your work. Right. And you can either choose to, you know, try to practice, you know, being most respectful back toward me to allow me to be just who I am, or you'll struggle with that. And then I'll probably need to do a wall of protection if I choose to continue to stay in relationship with you because you're an important person to me. Yeah, and I think that's something also that people need to understand too is that people are or should be setting boundaries with you. And, you know, that person is doing it because they want to stay in the relationship. It's coming from a a place of love and protection and wanting to maintain that relationship. And, uh, you know, I think that when people are on the receiving end of being boundaried, <laughs> we'll call yeah. it, um, I think a lot of people, a tendency is to not react positively. And, you know, I just want to encourage all, all our listeners to say that when people set boundaries with you, it's because they love you and they want to have this relationship with you. Yes. And they're revealing themselves that they're trying to love themselves differently, right. which is the most cre- uh, courageous act. We're in the presence of someone who's being uber courageous and vulnerable with us by setting their boundaries. Our challenge is celebrating a no. Right. And we do not know how to do that. Right. Yeah. As yeah. a species, <laughs> I, no, I, I agree. I agree, we and, have a and hard you know, time celebrating a no, yeah, right. And, and you know, I think also about the idea of vulnerability and, and how that plays into boundaries, and how difficulty being vulnerable is going to result in a more difficult time setting boundaries. What are your thoughts about that? No, I, I think it's all it's all mushed in together you're exactly Mm -hmm. right because the whole idea of vulnerability um usually creates the emotion of fear right and we're going to be resistant because vulnerability uh is risky to the midbrain right it is and anything that's risky to the midbrain we're probably going to then go into our adapted state which is about our old wounding and we'll either have we'll move into too little boundary or too much boundary because we're trying to regulate something that will not be regulated from the midbrain because it's going to be very dualistic, either or, black, white, right, wrong, all or nothing. We're either in or we're out, you know, and we've, we're trying to get that frontal cortex back online, whatever trick helps <laughs> breathing, right. mindfulness, movement, you know, talking to someone, whatever, so that that's where our boundary work is, is up front. That's the way I I understand it. And I'm not a direct scientist, but that's where I understand boundary work. Boundary firing is from up here. And then that helps to regulate this. And then from here, we can be expansive and just be present to what is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can be accepting of me as I am, and I can be more accepting of you as you are and the world and the weather and you know as painful as it is you know politics and other people and things that i struggle with you know Mm -hmm. it's just going to keep coming back to can i release and just be in love with reality and that doesn't mean that we become a doormat you know and just get stomped over because we're going to have better boundaries than that we're not going to we're not going to put ourselves in positions with people who are offending. So the other thing that I want to mention about boundaries is that they can change over time in the same 
relationship with the same person. And I think that's an important thing for people to keep in mind with this as well is just because you're okay with something three months ago, maybe, maybe that's not feeling so great anymore, you know, like, and, and that's okay. That is totally okay. And you're right. So that's, you know, when we go back to uh, thinking about boundaries is are fluid and they're dynamic and they're going to, they're going to move with us. And probably what most people realize is I started out with either way too much or way too little. And now I'm kind of coming into some more moderate, but I may have walled somebody off that now I'm feeling better about the, my capacity to take care of myself when I'm in the presence of that person. So I'm more uh, comfortable showing up to be with them because I know I can use my voice to say, hey, no, I don't think I'm going to be able to do that or whatever. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think you're exactly right. Sometimes we go off to the other end of the, of the seesaw, but then we'll come back to moderation. Yeah, yeah. And so, no, you know, earlier we talked about trauma and how that can certainly impact a person's ability to know what healthy relationships even look like. I mean, including the idea of boundaries. Can you give some examples of types of trauma that might result in an individual struggling with setting and maintaining boundaries? Yeah, I think, you know, probably the two uh, kind of most obvious would be um, thinking about attachment styles, either anxiously attached or avoidant. So if we're little and we're in a relationship with primary caregivers that are too enmeshing, they're too, they're too anxiously attached to us as children, our natural inclination will be to do what? Mm -hmm. will be to wall off mm -hmm. to kind of put our protective, you know, Ooh, you're too much for me. You're going to gobble me up. And yet then we also stay um, obligated and feel that we need to take care of this person. But that oftentimes sets up an avoidant response in ourselves. So we'll have too much boundary as we will normalize that and we'll perceive relationships that get too close to us people who want us to show up and feel or something, you know, have a feeling that you're too much. And so we'll have too much boundary in those relationships. And then on the op other end of the continuum, if we're in a relationship when we're little with people who are unavailable for whatever reason, that sense of unavailability sets us up to be a little more wavy and a little more anxiously attached, right? We're Scarcity. It, exactly. We're tugging on coattails Hey, do you see me? Hey, did you see what I did at school? Hey, 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 hey. And we're getting, you're, we're wanting them to turn around. And that leaning toward them is going to be too little boundary. Right. So when we think about just attachment style, avoidant, too much boundary, I'm walling off. Anxious attachment, too little boundary. I'm over in your business. I want to fix you. I'm, uh, uh, uh. And so just those natural attachment experiences that we have so, so, so young before mm -hmm. we're even conscious of it is normalizing a boundary system. Now, most people totally experience that they're not just one or the other. Everybody can say, yes, in these environments, I have too much boundary. And in these environments, I have way too little. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But I, yeah. I think it all starts so, so young before our brain has any cognition of it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, which is unfortunate, you know? <laughs> yes. And, you know, I remind people all the time that shifting in yourself, that adapting is out of your intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's not out of some weakness. It's out right. of this core brain function of staying alive. I want to go into a little staying alive. Stay <laughs> <laughs> and, and we, you know, so we, that, that's where we shift our perception of this isn't something I'm trying to get rid of and to stop doing and that I want to carve out of myself and toss away. It's something I want to make friends with that I want to turn toward with compassion. I want to embrace. I want to integrate that. I want to uh, hug that part of me. Um, I'm trying to learn more and more about internal family systems. I'm so fascinated how it dovetails with all of this as well. Yep, and, totally. Yes. And, 
you know, these parts that are all about protecting us, that's out of our intelligence. And, you know, if I understand, um, you know, internal family systems, well, it's not even as a result of trauma. It's that we had these parts to begin with. And so when I think of it that way, it's like, wow, they come, all of this comes to our aid. We are, we, we innately knew how to protect ourselves so that we could stay alive on the planet. And we could keep someone attached to us because we knew we had them. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so that normalizing of it is we're just trying to turn toward it, to know our story, to get a bigger picture. Oh, okay. Now I know what's happening when I'm in boundary failure. I'm just having a trauma response. I'm having an old adapted response. <sighs> now breathe. Can I affirm myself and then turn the page? And move on. Yeah. And, you know, another thing that made me think of, like, you know, trauma-related stuff and boundaries is, like, gaslighting and how people come to question themselves through that process. That's right. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm curious, you know, we have external boundaries, right, that we set with others in the world, but we also have internal boundaries. Can, can you speak a little about those? Yeah, so... These two systems, if we think about the two jobs that boundaries serve us, they serve to protect us and they serve to contain us. So that's the jobs. Then the systems that we're protecting and containing is an external system of our physical distance and sexual distance with people. And that's actually the first boundary that we start learning when we're children good touch, bad touch, stranger danger, sharing, keeping your hands to yourself, not hitting, you know, that's external boundary work. Internal boundary work comes later, brain development wise, because right. now we're filtering what our opinion is, what our thought is. Can I discern my perception separate from your thoughts? Can I express my feeling and let it be different from your feeling. Can I choose to behave a certain way and let you behave a different way? That reality is about our, I have to contain myself to be insightful, to note, this is what I really think about this, uh -huh. or this is what I'm really feeling, or this is, oh, I own my behavior. I really did do that. And I have a feeling about uh -huh. that now. See, or this is, it's, it's what we struggle with, you know, when we have uh, uh, disordered eating is we don't have an internal boundary that's clear on the reality of our body. Right? Right. Right. And so that's that containing boundary so I can be insightful. And um, so the internal boundaries are the ones that are the most difficult. We're pretty most of us are pretty clear, you know, we're around people all the time who, I, I, this has come up a lot, I tell you, with the pandemic about external physical boundaries. Everybody's being asked to actually have a external mm -hmm. physical boundary, please distance. And you will be aware, aware immediately of the people who don't have healthy external boundaries. They're standing too close. They're, you know, when we were being uh, strongly encouraged to wear masks. They're not wearing masks. Mm -hmm. And it, this isn't a political issue. This is more an internal. I don't, I, I'm not conscious that this is making a difference to the world. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And so there's no judgment to it. It's just an awareness. But that, you know, the people pleasing, the struggling with, uh, you have a different opinion, the whole gaslighting. See, for, I, you can say that to me. But I need enough internal boundary to filter that to go, is that true? Am I an idiot? Right. Did I make that up? No, I don't think so. I have a different right. perception. And if I need to check that out, I'll go check that out with another functional secure adult. I probably am going to try to learn to not check it out in the system that I keep re-twisting myself into a pretzel something's getting triggered down here and I'll probably need a more objective reflection back. Yeah. That, yeah. That's hard for many people. 
And I think, I, I don't know what your thoughts about this are, but I think internal boundaries are much more difficult because we're accountable to ourselves for them, you know? That's right. That's exactly right. It's our internal work. It's us paying attention to us. I, I bet I've heard Pia say that a hundred times when she's working with, uh, especially with couples, you know, watch yourself. Stop. You're, you're an expert at watching your partner. You want to become an expert at watching yourself. What, what's happening to me right now? What am I experiencing? I'm twisting myself into a pretzel. Here, let me share to be known with you. Let me tell on me so that you, partner, can get to know me better. But I do this to me. And when we look at those, you know, I have that handout for boundaries and I have a list of examples of external and internal boundary violations. And there, it's no fun looking at that list of internal boundary violations because I'm sure most of us would say, holy cow. I do that shit all day long, <laughs> you know, it's because it's, it's so normalized in our culture. Right. right. So, and the biggest, the biggest, you know, I bring my attention a lot to the, the whole box there about, Oh, you know, justifying, defending, rationalizing, minimizing, mm -hmm. explaining. Mm -hmm. That's probably the most common. We immediately go into that. Well, that's midbrain. And midbrain is not boundaried, it, or it's either too much bound. It's walled off one end, or it is a shit ass no boundaries on the other end. It's all or nothing. So when we're explaining, we're just in that defensive mode, we're in that yeah. protecting mode, which has been normalized. So we're not judging it, but it will not resolve. It will not be relational. Right. Right. It keeps, it keeps us non-relational to ourselves so that we don't see our own truth or, or, or be in touch with our own reality. And it keeps us from experiencing someone else in their truth. Yeah. I don't know about you, but when the best way for me to know about when I need to set boundaries or what helps me know what my truth is, is I listen to my body and my gut quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Because we know our, our guts relate. <laughs> totally. It, right. And so right. something is up here is telling our system. I'm off. I'm not in alignment. And so I, I share that with clients a lot that, the page that has the five core practices. I said, just use that as an assessment tool. Mm -hmm. Start with the boundaries. And so if you're, um, you know, a great 12 step phrase is, you know, when we're restless, irritable, and discontent, well, back that up and ask yourself first, have I recently had a boundary struggle? Have I had too little boundary in some situation or was I too bound walled off? That will probably lead to the answer. <laughs> it's a good rule of thumb. Yeah, I like that. Just have I had too little boundary or too much boundary? And if we can answer it, then we'll find out, oh, this is what's probably going on because it's thrown right. everything else kind of out of kilter too. Yeah. So my, my last question for you on on this topic is what advice do you have for listeners who might be having a hard time setting boundaries in an important relationship for whatever their reasons might be? What, what would you like to pass along to them today? Um, you know, anything that you can read about boundaries, I think is important. I know that if you Googled, oh my goodness, if you Google, you know, boundary work, there's a thousand things out there. There are some, you know, little workbooks and, and I would start, I mean, if you're interested in starting with Pia's, you know, Pia Melody's work, her first book was uh, Facing Codependence. And there was a great workbook uh, called Breaking Free that um, correlated with that book. And it's filled with work pages that you work through basically these five core practices. You work through answering questions about your esteeming and feeling less than or better than. You work through pages around boundaries 
and noticing and making note. What are situations where I'm aware I really struggle with my boundaries? It may be specific people. It may be certain uh, situations at work or whatever. Uh, where do I notice that I have actually appropriate boundaries? You know, just mm-hmm. doing that assessment. But that workbook might be something that helps people. But I know that there are tons of other uh, resources. Um, you know, I am uh, wanting to, you know, I just, there's teachable moments, as you can tell, I love to teach <laughs> because I, I started out an educator. And this is all information that can be taught to people in non-therapeutic settings. Right. So that's something I'm looking at um, uh, kind of my next phase as well is maybe offering up webinars or workshops or some seminars where I can just teach people this stuff. And you would be awesome. You can take your own worksheet home and we'll practice talking, listening boundaries in those difficult situations. You'll learn all about boundaries, what they are, what they aren't. And then you'll just have it yourself. There's nothing in here that we need to do therapy around for you to learn. Right. Right. So, so I'll, um, I'll let you know uh, for sure, Noah, you know, when I get some things scheduled and um, I'll find some uh, platform to get that marketed out there, but yeah, um, please do. I'll look at offering some things to the general public and anybody, not just people who are in therapy or, you know, anyone could, can come and learn this. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for imparting all, all your knowledge around boundaries. Um, I want to move now into some more questions about you as a therapist. Okay. So my next question is what kinds of experience do you have working with particularly vulnerable clients, such as those are transgender, undocumented, or BIPOC to name a few examples? Yeah, I I would probably say a, a low percentage of my client population is in this vulnerable um, group. Um, I do have experience working with uh, LGBTQ. I have had many clients over the years um, who are gay or lesbian. Uh, I've had some clients who are uh, transgender or transitioning. And then I've had, uh, you know, a fair number of clients who are either multicultured uh, or uh, people of color. Very cool. Um, Here's one of Amanda's questions. How do you determine your client's treatment plan goals and and how would a client know that they're done with therapy? I know they're done when they stop coming. (laughs) (laughs) That's always a good measure. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, I guess they're finished. (laughs) Okay. So we start talking about that usually in that very first call, you know, when somebody calls and says, hey, you know, can I set up an appointment? I usually say, why do you want an appointment? What brought you to this decision that you think therapy might be a benefit? And then in that first session, we do a lot of talk around how will you know that you'll be finished with therapy? What would be, you know, what's the, the return on investment for you? Right. You know, and tell me more about what you hope to learn or find out about yourself or, or shift or change. And that's where, you know, my treatment goals come from the client. I, I, uh, I remind people often what you came here looking for, you came looking with. Right. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Okay. So next question is, are you a therapist who will laugh or cry with your clients? <laughs> what do you think? Of course. We're I laughing. To- you're, you're very relational. So I couldn't see that not happening. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I use a lot of humor. I think it's, uh, I think the more we can kind of learn to laugh at ourselves and be okay with uh, the, our authentic states and our, our true selves, you know, that we are perfectly imperfect and, and let's just enjoy being here on the planet. So, um, and I've certainly had moments when someone's uh, pain is painful for me as well in a, in a compassionate, uh, empathic way. Uh, Hopefully, uh, me maintaining my own boundaries. I find that totally appropriate to do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. Um, next one is an Amanda question. She asks, has there ever been a time that you've worked with a client for a period of time, but then realized that maybe it's not the best fit or you're not in a place, you don't have the, the information or skills or whatever it may be that that client needs? If so, what made you aware of that and, and how did you handle it? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I think that uh, befuddles a lot of us as uh, professionals, but it's also an ethical agreement that we have, you know, uh, to know when we are not the person. And so often it comes from just, you know, over time with a client, both of us recognizing things are, I'm not getting the goal that I came here for. I reassess goals, you know, and go back and read what they first, you know, said and say, hey, where are we on this? And do you think you need some different help? I'm not trained in some of the somatic uh, models, SE, or I'm not an EMDR trained uh, therapist. And many people want that or require or request that. And so that's when we say, well, let's find you somebody to do that and making that transition. You know, I have a, a group of people that I consult with and uh, other professionals. So that oftentimes is how I know I'm not the person anymore. But it's usually uh, a collaborative effort, between, you know, with me and the client. And, you know, it's like, who's the right person? Let's find them. Let's make that transition. I'm here to support you. And sometimes people go to that other, other source and they don't ever come back to me. And that's part of our own boundary system is to not twist ourselves into a pretzel when that happens. Because right. We, right. we want people to be with the best person for them. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Next is one of my favorite questions. <laughs> I love that. How do you define holding space for someone? So holding space starts with me containing me. It's holding space is a boundary practice of me. <laughs> Having enough containment with my energy, with my thinking, with my own emotion, with my behavior, to be still. Holding space for you means I'm holding my space. And if I'm revved up, I will not be holding space for you. I have a, I have a sticky on my um, computer uh, right up here by the camera that spells out the word WAIT, W-A-I-T. And it's an acronym for Why Am I Talking? I love it. <laughs> and I would probably guess that if we did a survey with my clients, they'd say, God, she talks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the teacher in me. And right. I have to really can rein that in. And um, that's my own boundary work, you know, to, to uh, not keep. Uh, and to keep pulling that in. And that's that containing boundary. So Holding space for everyone else is because I'm in a contained, aligned spot. That is such a, I think that's my favorite answer I've had on this show so far. I think that gives like so much, you know, because it's a, it's a difficult concept to explain, you know, and it's like, well, I'm like doing this, but like, <laughs> and doing this, but, but ultimately what it is, is, is it's our, our own containment. I'm doing nothing when I'm holding space for you. Right. Yeah. And that's the hard part, which is why, you know, if we're engaged in some mindfulness practice or meditation, that's where we learn how to do that in a, in a short amount of time. Because mm -hmm. we don't have much time in a 50-minute session, you know. Right. We right. have to be able to access that pretty quick. And, and it's hard for us because, wow, we're a human. And we have our own ship. Yeah. <laughs> Stirring totally. us out in here. Right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so uh, next question is, what have you personally learned about yourself and or the world through your practice? You know, that I'm still a work in progress. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what I see. And that I'm more alike. We're all more alike than we are different. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we, you know, I know we have to be careful about transference and counter transference, but I tell you what, if you don't see yourself in every client that walks in the door, you're not looking. <laughs> you know, there's something that's like, gosh, another human, just like me, you know? So, you know, that and um, probably the most, uh, the, um, you know, especially this boundaries work, I think uh, it's the most common feedback I get from my consult group when I bring issues is, wow, you're working harder than the client. Yep. <laughs> it's like, that's ah. a big one. Yeah, uh, that's right. That's right. So, and that's a containment practice to rein myself in and 
just be still right where they people are. Yep. So, yep. Yeah. All right. And I, and I think, you know, I'm going to add to that, that I think too, what I'm learning is that I really do have something to share with people. Mm-hmm. And I think we sometimes, you know, that's that old thing is that I, I shouldn't be saying that, but yeah, I do. I do say that. I think I get that feedback that I learn a lot from you. That's a, a that's something that I hear from clients. My other therapist, didn't, no one told me that. I never knew that. And I think that learning about ourselves um, is so important that we have. Something I, to, you know, to yeah, do. no, I, I totally agree. You know, I, I consider myself like a continuous student in life and, and of myself and like being knower of myself, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, boundary work can be pretty heavy sometimes. What do you do to take care of yourself? And and is there one thing that after just an awful day at work, you, you just have to do for yourself? Oh, man, I do a lot of things. And so I don't know that I can narrow it down to one. But I think probably the most important thing for me is to have my own group of people to connect with. That's, you know, that when work is done, because we do people work, it's so easy for us to carry people work into all of our work. Yeah. If, you know, if we were um, doing something else that had to do with things or processes, you know, we leave that when we leave uh, the office or the factory or the, you know, shop. Uh, but our work is with us all the time because it's so it is relational. And so I need a distinct separate group to, of people to relate to. And so friends that I can go play cards with or uh, who will go for a walk or who can get together and we'll have a meal and laugh and talk about, you know, just, you know, Ozark or what's on Netflix and which would be my next thing that <laughs> I might do is, you know, man, I shut down. I might go for a walk, uh, clear my head and my, you know, energy space, come home, fix something to eat. And it's like, I get a little bit of yum, yum. I can't wait to sit and see what's happening next. <laughs> you know, season 47, episode 67. <laughs> you know, it's like, gosh, gosh, Cynthia. But and I am a I'm a big movie fan. I love all things movies. So um, I love exploring. You know, I've got my Oscar list already printed out. So oh wow, I, I, I guess that doesn't really surprise me, given what you had mentioned earlier about you know yeah theater and yeah yeah yeah. yeah. So so I'm kind of on a mission to see uh, all of the you know the ten movies that are listed for you know best movie. And, uh, Very cool. So those are things. Uh, that's, I, I think, yeah, having a, a group of people is so important, I think, when you're a therapist, um, especially, you know, I think also, like, having therapist friends and non-therapist friends, I think, is also important. Um, yeah, it's, 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 I think therapists as people, to me, is always very interesting. I don't know. Because we, we are people too, and I think a lot of people forget that, um, you know, that we we do hard things in our personal lives too all the time, you know. That's exactly right. In fact, that was a question, uh, one of Amanda's questions that I wasn't sure that I understood, but I think that's what you're relating to. It was that question eight about, is there anything related to therapy or being a therapist that you've been curious about what a client's perspective may be? Yeah, uh, yeah. Is that what you're saying? That clients don't sometimes, you know, they must wonder about us sometimes about having a, a real life that we're taking care of, you know, puppies and a, a old cat and that our car breaks down and we get irritated with people and, you know, on and on and uh, that we're really human, you know, yeah, just yeah. like everybody yeah. else. Yeah, yeah that just that we, we're not immune to the no. things that happen to everybody else in life, you know? Yes. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I appreciate uh, your your answers on that. Sure. So my my next question is my second favorite. 
question, which is how would you, how would you define happiness? You know, I, when I read that question, um, you know, I, I would start out by saying, well, you know, it's an emotion, but, um, uh, I consider joy, the emotion and happiness is uh, a result of something. Um, uh, David Brooks wrote, um, um, a commencement uh, talk for somebody and, and he had something posted in New York Times about happiness and joy. And it was like, yeah, I think that's how I kind of distinguish the two. And maybe we get them mixed up sometimes, but that happiness usually involves, you know, some victory for ourself. Uh, mm -hmm. We've uh, maybe we've accomplished something that we experience, you know, I'm happy when there's kind of a, a condition attached to happiness. Um, right. and at the same time, you know, we also hear, you know, happiness is a decision. It's, I decide either I'm going to be happy or I decide I'm going to be miserable, but it all comes from the same area. You know, I'm thinking a story, which is creating the, the emotional response, but that right. joy, you know, tends to involve a transis, a transcendence of ourself, you know, um, that when our heart is in something else, we're going to experience joy. And that can be spontaneous. Um, you know, I don't know about you, but I experience that a lot when I'm out in nature. Uh, all of yeah. a sudden, you know, I might say, oh, I'm really happy. But really what I think I'm experiencing is joy because something in my heart kind of swells when I yeah. see the, the peacocks walking around, you know, uh, Maddie's restaurant or something, or I see uh, children out playing and being, you know, so real. That's joyful for me, you know. And uh, I think he said in that article, that commencement, that joy is the present that life gives to you as you give away your gifts to the world. I thought, oh, makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah. So, yeah. So that was more of a narrative on happiness and joy. <laughs> no, it, it makes sense to me for sure. Um, next question is, are you in therapy or have you ever been in therapy? Or do I need to be in therapy? <laughs> <laughs> I have been in therapy. I've done my work. I mean, not that I'm ever finished with any work, uh, I've, uh, but I've, I've done individual therapy and um as you can kind of tell, I'm a recovery person. Um, mm -hmm. I have uh, 39 years of recovery now and um, 10 years into my recovery, I actually went to treatment to learn about my own codependence and family of origin issues and trauma and which I hadn't, you know, really touched much on in individual therapy. So I've done a lot of core work around uh, my history. I still continue to do things today but I've shifted a little more. Uh, my 12 step program served a lot for me as well as um, a spiritual practice. So I have some, I have some spiritual mentors that um, I'm in conversation with or in group with. And uh, that's, that's kind of what continues to feed me. And then I just have some good friends that call me on my, you know, <laughs> shit now and then who I can go turn yeah. myself into and say, okay, I give, I'm not sure what's going on, but you know, help me sort this out. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, is there anything else that you think would be good for a potential client or other therapists to know about you? And also what is the best way for people to contact you? Okay. Um, so the best way to contact me is either by my email. Um, and that is uh, cshebel at austin.rr.com. And the challenging part will be spelling my name. So it's just my first initial, C as in Cynthia, followed by my last name, S-C-H-I-E-B-E-L at austin.rr.com. And anyone's welcome to email me if they have questions. Um, and you're welcome to also give me a, a, a ring, a call, or leave a message. And a good number would be 512 Four four five zero one five three five one two four four five zero one five three, and uh, 
you can leave a message there. You're welcome to. And I, I think, you know, as far as uh, other things, I think, you know, what I mentioned earlier about what's kind of some more things I'm looking at doing is to provide more um, uh, offerings around teaching around these topics that just make my heart sing so much and sharing it out and increasing probably my coaching practice. Uh, something that I've thought about is maybe offering some workshops around, you know, um, these five core practices and around boundaries followed up with maybe four coaching sessions afterwards, you know, if you need some additional help with practicing like the talking, listening boundary in different situations, yeah. which would be good kind of teachable moments for people. Yeah, very cool. Stay tuned. So stay tuned to that. Or if there's anyone out there who has, um, I've had, I've had other colleagues say, you know, I just have a client who could learn something about boundaries and you could probably teach them that part. You know, if there are people who say in our group or in our therapist, uh, if we have a, a group therapy practice, if a group of professionals wanted me to come and spend a couple of hours just teaching how I teach boundaries to clients, I'm happy to do that with other professionals uh, because I'm, I'm happy to give all of this away. It's exactly what Pia Melody wanted us to do. As long as we maintain fidelity to how, you know, right, it was taught to us. And I've got that part down. So I don't stray very far from how, I, how I've learned it. Awesome. Well, Cynthia, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you oh, so much for being on the show. Noah, thank you. It's been so much fun. I've enjoyed talking about all of this and getting to know you as well. And the great work that you're doing with all these podcasts, you have just, uh, a wonderful library of uh, interesting uh, people. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah. The next question. The next question. Thank you for listening to Next Quest Podcast. We learned something new today and hope you did too. Today's episode wraps up season five. I can't believe it's already been five seasons of uh, this podcast. I'm looking forward to season six. Episode one of season six will feature Atosha Salazar, licensed professional counselor, who will be speaking about her practice in an area of interest, anxiety, neurodivergence, and communication. Next Quest Podcast is sponsored by Jan Dimmit Resources. Save yourself the time and stress of credentialing and let the experts at Jan Dimmit Resources do what they do best. For over 20 years, Jan Dimmit Resources has provided administrative support and credentialing services to mental health professionals in Texas and beyond. Visit their website at jandimmit.com. That is J A N D I M M I T T.com or call 512-731-5725 for more information on all the ways they can make running your practice easier for you. Next Quest Podcasts relies solely on donations to keep this project going. Please consider becoming a patron on my Patreon page at www.patreon that's p a t r e o n .com slash nextquestpodcast or you can make a one-time donation on my website at www.nextquestcounseling.com slash about next quest podcast. You can also support the podcast by liking our Facebook page. Until next question, this is Noah Garcia signing off.